Good afternoon, everybody. I'm quite intimidated by three things. One, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to <laughs> speak to you. And two, I really do not have any wisdom on this matter. In fact, I don't think I have much wisdom, and I learned that long ago, the day I got married. So. <laughs> and three, I realize I'm the only man standing between you and lunch. So I'm really intimidated, but you know, you cannot help but be wiser by the minute. So I'm not a wise man, but I'm wiser by the minute, and I'm certainly wiser since morning. I'm quite enthused by what I have seen here today. And I'd like to say something particularly from the Indian context, where many things are happening in education, and we need to go a long way to achieve what we think we need to achieve in India particularly. I have been engaged with this business of online learning for the last 15 years, almost. And I became a convert long ago when I came across a University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign study. I'm a mathematician. And I came across a study where they had a whole bunch of students taking a freshman course in calculus totally online and one in the regular fashion. And the learning outcomes were absolutely identical. And I became a convert at that time. Does that mean online had anything to do with that? And that's one of the things I learned very much after I became involved in this, that that's not the point. The point is that there has to be some power in the idea that you're trying to transmit. If you have that, I do not think the technology will matter so much. And let me quickly demonstrate so that it gives us some insight into how we could do something with MOOCs. So you know about my conservative estimates more than 5,000 years ago from today. My conservative estimates, but there are many estimates that take it back to 8,000 years ago. There was a body of knowledge developed in India in a bunch of four books called the Vedas. The first one, the Rig Veda, is a book of powerful ideas. And its opening stanza says, let noble ideas come from every direction. It's that liberal in its thoughts. And this book was never written until after the time of Christ. It was transmitted through an oral tradition. But in almost no time, it had impacted the whole of the subcontinent and then beyond that into other lands. What was the technology that they used? It covered huge, huge swaths of not just land, but population. But what technology? Just the oral tradition. That's how they remembered and transmitted knowledge in India. Because there was power in the idea of the Vedas. That was massive open learning. But there was something else connected with it. That's something I believe we must recognize as educators. The needs of society were connected with the knowledge of the Vedas. They delivered on the needs of society. And that was through a hands-on fashion. And when such powerful ideas get transmitted, Nothing, not even the tyranny of geography can stand in the way. And let me just quickly then give you quick illustrations on, on some other such ideas, which also stand the test of time. And no technology seems to have been recognized as to how they happened. And look, look at the Concord movement of the West, the transcendentalists, Emerson, Thoreau, Ruskin, all of them, Carlyle. They impacted a whole generation and their times and a whole bunch of lands. They played a powerful role in the life of Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, Gandhi discovered what his calling in life was when he read Ruskin's Unto This Last. He read it in South Africa. It came to him from the West, and he was an Indian. Just think about that. And when I delved into the Concordists, I realized that they had been impacted by the knowledge of the Vedas and the Upanishads that date back to thousands of years before Christ. The ideas embodied in them had traveled to the West. I have no idea what technology. Then they came back to the East and influenced Mahatma Gandhi. And the story doesn't end. 
Gandhi's ideas went back to influence Martin Luther King, and so on and so forth. And I don't know what technology was being used. And they cut across populations. They cut across geographical boundaries. So somewhere, when we get into this business of massive online learning, the most important thing that we should realize is to come to grips with the needs of society with powerful ideas. And then learning happens in a natural fashion. And I've seen that time and again. Many years ago, I was, though I'm a research, I was a research mathematician, and I'd like to believe I still am, even though I'm vice chancellor. I remember this, sometime in 92, I was persuaded by the government to give six courses on the introduction to the calculus through the national television channel linked through satellite. And almost every school in India was part of the audience. And a bunch of selected schools all over India could talk to me interactively while I was teaching. The only technology I had was the television set, and they could call me up on the phone live. And I had two cameras, one above my head, and half the time I was worried, and the other facing me. And I wrote text. And the camera would face, the one facing me would then focus when I would speak. And I had no idea what the impact was. I enjoyed that interactive session. I introduced the basic ideas of the calculus until, and those were primitive times, until about 15 to 20 days later, I was called by the television channel, led into a room in which the entire floor was covered with sacks of mail, sent from different parts of India, People urging that the lessons continue. I'm not trying to sell myself. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> urging also, why don't their teachers teach the way they were taught on television? This was primitive technology, using paper, pencil, and two cameras, and the telephone. I ran a helpline on the phone for students all across India 24-7. In fact, for a whole month. For any students before their higher secondary school leaving examinations, for any help in mathematics, no one believed me. And we used the phone to such powerful effect. We had many phone lines, volunteers who had been trained. And I believe that generation, that one particular time, did fairly well in math examination of that year. It made a huge impact. I heard about the radio. I believe the radio hasn't been exploited. I think somewhere we educators have missed the point. And I'm not talking simply of teaching the way we have been taught in those traditional classrooms. I went to classes where there were only 15 or 20 students, and I learned nothing. And I went to classes where there were 60 to 100 students, and I learned nothing. And I learned in classes where there were 100 students, and there were 15 students. Had nothing to do with class numbers. Again, the idea was the person, the person passing on those ideas. And the one thing that I have learned, the most important thing, is that the use of hands in education gets you to imbibe things. The use of hands. And Mahatma Gandhi said that. And Gandhi never spoke on anything until he had experimented and learned. And in education, he had experimented like anything. He first set up a school which he ran. Then he set up a university that runs till today. He also set up a technical institute for women. And he said, in education, it is important to get people to do things with their hands. What you do with your hands will enter your heart. If we get these learning methodologies, if we redefine education, then I believe all these issues about MOOCs will melt into the background, and we will be able to transform society. We need to connect. If we are to affect large populations, we need to connect with the needs and challenges of society and of nations. And we are trying to do that. And I have learned this time and again. Some time back, a yoga guru in India began to teach Indians through television yoga. And people decried it. They said, that's not the way to do yoga. But he transformed the country in about two or three months. He was so good. And he connected with the needs of society. He used yoga to good effect to cure any kind of ill connected with health. And he used it to good effect. I came across countless people. And he used only the television. 
And he had audiences that would come back to him with feedback. But those were needs of society, and he made people practice while it was demonstrated. The use of hands, this constant practice that works, and in group learning. That's the other insight we have. That's why Mahatma Gandhi succeeded with his lessons of Satyagraha. He was totally out of the box. Till he came, India's freedom movement used to sort of you know, meander along in different traditional ways. People would meet, pass resolutions, sometimes be jailed, and nothing would happen. Till Gandhi came and he decided to educate a whole nation on the power of nonviolence and truth. And I don't know what technology he used. It was the power of his ideas that transformed the whole country. And he educated India into the basics of nonviolence. I have read and talked to people in my very young days who had worked with Mahatma Gandhi. The magic of his ideas came across to me in those times. And therefore, I urge all to think carefully. I don't believe MOOCs is the issue. The issue <coughs> is if we want MOOCs to succeed, and they must, particularly in the context of my country, where millions seek education, in the next 10 years, more than 100 million youth will cross high school and wish to enter the portals of higher education. My university is one of the largest in India. We have half a million on our rolls. If I were to build 50 such universities, I still wouldn't serve the needs of India, and I can't build 50 such universities in 100 years, such as mine. How do I serve the needs? And this is a gene pool that is entering portals of higher education for the first time. They are hungry for knowledge. They come from rural and semi-rural backgrounds. And they want to do something. And they are inspired by the challenges of society and by the needs of the nation. And we have to seize, we in India have to seize the moment. So I seek to partner with good thinking individuals and institutions in the West so that we could take these ideas there and try and bring about some good. But I'd like to add my own penny's worth of experiences to this. At the University of Delhi, we are already underway with many experiences and experiments. Our entire system runs through a bunch of undergraduate colleges that belong to us. They're 80 odd in number spread across the entire city of Delhi. And they are all linked to the National Knowledge Network. This is a powerful high bandwidth tool that the government has provided, spending billions of dollars connecting the whole country. It's an internet superhighway that connects the whole country and is now beginning to permeate almost every village of India. It is such a powerful tool. All my colleges are connected to that, and we are connected to every educational institution in India. Some time back, we were visited by Michael Sandel, the Harvard philosopher, and as a demonstration of the power of this tool, I organized a lecture by him, an interactive lecture. We all know Sandel's style. 500 institutions across the country were connected. And he took a lecture for an hour, a proper lecture, interactively with these 500 institutions. He could pick institutions at random on a large screen, and they could talk to him, and the rest could watch. And the whole thing is digitally stored. That's also a version of MOOCs. We are also every single first year student of my university, and that's 65,000 of them, have been provided with a state of the art laptop, totally free of cost. Government believes we need to put money into higher education. We have the internet. And now these students, I'm told by faculty who teach them, that the students, because they're learning in a different mode, and they learn in groups through projects largely. And they tell me that the students are beginning to lead the faculty. Because we've identified nine challenges of India. And that's where the learning is coming from, in a transdisciplinary fashion. This is also a kind of MOOC system. So I believe we need to redefine education. I also think I'm not saying that campuses and universities as they exist today are outmoded. But certainly a new kind of university must also emerge. It must be more in our minds. The campus must exist in the mind. And once you have the campus in the mind, and the mind is so powerful, there are no limits to it. So your campus will be an unlimited enterprise. Once we allow that to happen, good things will flow. We will have redefined education. This business of certification and examination needs to be totally redefined. We need to get out of the box 
And we are trying to do that at the University of Delhi in many ways. Real life experiences are also being accorded credit. So we need to have credit systems that allow us to recognize merit no matter where it comes from society. You may or may not have heard of the Tiffin Carriers of Mumbai. It's a huge enterprise, a cooperative enterprise. Hundreds of thousands of lunchbox Tiffins are carried each morning from individual homes and they converge to offices spread all across the city of Mumbai and in the afternoon they're delivered back to the homes they came from with almost zero error. There is huge mathematics sitting inside. Anybody who goes and undertakes a course with these Tiffin carriers gets credit into my systems. What we need to do is figure out ways and means of recognizing knowledge. Remember, if we're talking about MOOCs and a new sort of university campus that exists in the mind, university systems must generate knowledge and must be connected to systems of knowledge. Knowledge doesn't only exist or be generated inside the university. Expand the university to include knowledge areas all over.